This is Harley Hartwell, and you're listening to the Case Closed Podcast. Yeah, and these are things you wouldn't know unless, of course, you're the voice actor yourself and you're in that position. And that's what the interesting part of this whole thing is for me. Yeah, I mean, again, it's it's the little tricks of. Uh, you know, actually, I was just I was just at an acting class with Tony Oliver last night. We were talking about it. You know, having to to hear yourself in that first bit, and then just you know, I even just repeat the lines as I'm hearing myself and keep the flow going. You know, and uh, Funimation's really, really good about you know really keeping that quality level high. I remember. So. Well, I think it's really valuable, too, because, I mean, at the end of the day, it, it is a business. And I think people that are trying to break into voice acting kind of view it as something that's where it's a lot of fun and it doesn't take a lot of work. Um, the way you're talking about it really explains it from a business point of view. It, it's a lot of fun. You know, it's a lot of fun. Um, uh, it is a business. You know, I, I know a lot of a lot of uh, I've had some fans in the past. Say, well, you guys just like hang out all day. It's like, no, you know, you're on deadlines. I mean, I, I directed um, the last 10 episodes of a series called Peach Girl and, you know, having to schedule actors and, you know, you got to come in get your 75 lines an hour or whatever and get them out to get the next person in, you know, so it's a lot of fun. Yes, but it's definitely a business and you just got to keep, keep moving, you know? And so it's uh, definitely challenging, but a lot of fun. Yeah. Now you've brought up directing. Is it something that you enjoy doing more than even doing voices or could you explain that and elaborate on that? No, I, I'm, I'm first and foremost an actor. Uh, it, it was just, uh, uh, it was fun directing. Um, and I wouldn't mind doing it again at some point, but I, I prefer definitely being in front of the mic rather than being behind it. <laughs> I'm selfish like that. Yeah. Now, can you talk about kind of how you got involved with directing? Was it something you asked to do or was it just something that, uh, you were asked to do by maybe a fellow director at the time, uh, just to kind of get your feet wet in that field. Sure. I mean, uh, you know, I, uh, I just asked one day, I mean, I, I guess I'd been there about, uh, let's see, cause I directed in 2007. So I'd been there a couple of years and I just sent an email to, uh, 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 Justin, the main producer and say, I'm interested in directing, you know, what, what options might there be to, to try? And so what they started me on it, I'm mean, I assume they, they start this on everyone is I'd, I went in and just sat on, on a directing session, which would which sounds strange because you're thinking, well, I've been recording all this time. I shouldn't shouldn't have to do that. But it really is, you know, sitting behind the director and watching he or she uh, work with actors and how to, you know, having to think about the whole script and all the voices at one time, you know, whereas an actor, I'm just worrying about me. Um, so I did that. Uh, I sat in with um, Colleen Klinkenbaird, which was really awesome, uh, with Mike. And then they, I became a substitute director. So, you know, uh, I remember Caitlin uh, had to go to a convention or something, and uh, she had scheduled a recording session for Friday. And so I went in and directed that myself, you know, to get my feet wet. And then I guess after a couple of months, um, uh, uh, Zach, whose last name I can't remember now, he's a great guy. And, uh, and uh, but anyway, Zach, he was directing Peach Girl, and they offered me to direct the last 10 episodes. And so uh, I did. And it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. Very, very challenging. You know, I mean, you, you, that, it's added stress because you're not just directing the voice actors. Then you have to listen to the whole thing to make sure it works, you know, and sign off in the episode. Then, does you know, does my producer sign off on it? You know, does something need to be fixed? Like, I remember there was one actor, uh, and I feel horrible because I cannot remember his name, but he went on to Breaking Bad, actually. Um, but I had him do a scene where a character, his character was just waking up. And I didn't direct it well because he's, it sounded like he was fully awake. And so when I sat down to watch it, I said, this just doesn't sound right. So I had to call him back in, you know, this was one and, and have him redo it and say, you're just waking up. We need the grogginess, you know, the, you know, the kind of like, oh, I'm awake now kind of feeling in the voice. And so that was, you know, learning, learning steps like that is, is definitely something that uh, I enjoyed. Um, and again, I wouldn't mind doing it again. Um, uh, I, I was offered another show, but I had just been cast in a theater show, and so I couldn't take it. And uh, maybe someday again I will. We'll see. Is theater your first love? That's that's my first love, yeah. I, I've been doing theater for 20 years, 
um, a lot of Shakespeare, a lot of modern comedies. I worked uh, full time at a children's theater in San Antonio for uh, off and on about five years. Uh, I was a the assistant technical director. I did light design. Was a teacher. Yeah. So theater is theater is where um, you know a lot of voice actors come out of theater. Um, you know, if you look at a lot of the, you know, you know, cause I always get asked, you know, do you have to have acting experience? Well, it is voice acting, you know, people kind of forget the acting part of the phrase. And, uh, you know, that's where you really get to, you know, learn how to interpret scripts and how to approach, you know, creating characters and taking direction. You know, do you, can you understand what a director says? Well, I need something like this instead of what you're doing now, you know, and understanding that and be able to, you know, produce it. And theater is just a, a great a great experience for that. Yeah. Well, the thing is, is that people try to make voice acting like people that aren't in it try to make it sound like it's so easy, and it's 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 really not. It's something that you know you've talked about. You have to work at for years and years and years to be really good at it, and you have to be dedicated and be willing to show that you're willing to take time to develop yourself as an actor and to also develop the characters that you're voicing. And I, I'm really glad that you're emphasizing on that. Yes. It, it, oh, absolutely. It's it's the thing of some people don't really know the specifics, but they think they do. And then yes. and then it's when you ask them and then they just come out and say, you have to do it this way, not yeah. the way you think. And it kind of hurts some people. But it, it's what that old saying, the truth hurts because, you know, it does. They can't, they can't they can't just <clears throat> expect something and then. You know, it turns out that way. That's just how it is sometimes. Exactly. Uh, you know, I mean, I it, it, I think with a lot of what happens with a lot of fans and a lot of kids who want to do this is they kind of think, well, it just sounds like it's so easy to do. You're just talking into a microphone, and it's a lot more than that. And uh, like, or, or like, you know, they think we all record together. Like I had a girl say, um, you know, what was it like, you know, recording with Vic Mignogna on Full Metal Alchemist? And I said, well, I never actually met him until way after the series had been recorded already. And it was like, well, don't you all record together? And it's like, no, <laughs> we don't. <laughs> you know, you're in a booth by yourself with the engineer and director because you're recording to picture and you got to take the time to. I'm the 10 take wonder. It takes me sometimes forever to get a line right because. If I speak too fast, it's too short. If it, you know, it was too long, or maybe the script doesn't have enough words, you know. So if you have all the other actors there waiting for you to get one line right, I mean, that's a waste of their time. It's a waste of money, you know. So yeah, no, we we it, it, so people sometimes are shocked that we all record individually, you know, compared to like some American cartoons where, you know, the actors do actually sit in a circle and record and can feed off of each other because it hasn't been drawn yet. You know, but um, so I think, you know, you know, that, that we are recording to picture by ourselves is one one shock um, needing acting experience. I, I did get a message from a young lady who said, uh, well, you know, you don't have to have acting experience. Right. And I said, well, no, you, you kind of have to, you know, and and she thought, well, can I just call up the studio and, and ask to, to be in something? It's like <laughs> it doesn't doesn't work that way. You know, in fact, I, I may have changed. But I remember on Funimation's website where it said you could send in, you know, a demo, but the first line, you know, so the requirement says, you know, you have to have extensive acting experience. I mean, it, it, this is acting. This is creating a character. It isn't just, you know, having a, 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 a silly voice and talking to a microphone. I mean, everyone can do voices. It's can you can you build a believable character? You know, and I even today, you know, like I said, I, I'm I take acting classes now. I was with one with Tony Oliver. I just took Crispin Freeman's anime class just to keep my chops up. You know, you have to. And as you said earlier, this is a competitive business. You know, you're not the only one who wants to get in. There's thousands of people who want to get in. I mean, I can't imagine how many demos Funimation must get, you know, every week from people. Um, uh, there's a, a, a book. Um, called How to Read Copy, written by a guy named Adrian Cronauer, who, is, uh, who was portrayed by Robin Williams in a, in a movie called Good Morning Vietnam. And he wrote, he wrote this book about, you know, voiceover. It's a little, it's a little dated because, you know, we're talking 80s here and, you know, the voice, the, the radio market and, you know, the, the days of the announcer has kind of disappeared. But he opens up the book by saying voiceover is the second most difficult form of entertainment to get into next to high fashion modeling. And I think that's still could be considered true today, you know, because everybody wants to be in it. Um, because it doesn't matter what you look like, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I've, I've definitely recorded auditions at home in my pajamas, <laughs> you know, um, 
but it's it, it it is a very competitive business, and I think a, a lot of uh, a lot of kids don't quite grasp that, and it can be you know it's vicious, you know, um, because again everybody wants to do it. I think with kids today too, they try to go for the big role, but I think a lot of them don't even realize that even getting one line in an anime is is huge because it's most it's much more than what anybody else usually gets. That's a start. Absolutely. It's a start. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I mean, I, I, you know, I'm, I mean, I was never, I mean, so I was with Funimation for about four years overall. And I, if I let my last count, I auditioned for 36 different shows. That means I auditioned for 36 main characters in four years. I got one. I had one lead role in my entire time there. Um, which I'm very thankful for. I'm not saying oh, I'm bitter. No, no, I was very thankful for it. But again, the competition is that fierce. You know, there's no guarantee. You know, what you hear in your head is not what the director may hear as the lead voice. You know, mm-hmm. and that's uh, that, that, that's been a hard thing for me uh, is learning. You know, where do I fit? And I'm I'm kind of in a weird little balance. I was talking to um, uh, a director once, saying he was how he he would say, Kevin, I have a little trouble casting you because you're an older guy. You know, I'm 41 now, but I don't have that deep, mature, you know, necessarily mature voice. You know, I'm still kind of in the younger range. So I don't know where to put you, you know. So, uh, you know, what we hear and what we believe we are because is not necessarily what everyone else hears. And that's also a bit of a shock to people, I think. Uh, Definitely for me. (laughs) Well, honestly, I think it's funny that you say that because, I mean, your age shouldn't necessarily matter if you have a youthful voice. You have a youthful voice, right? I mean, does that really play into it that much? Um, that's one thing I'd have to wonder about that. It just it, it, it affects it where, and where they can cast me voice-wise and what type of characters I do. You know, for a long time, I, uh, uh, I, I, love, I love playing villains. I, you know, villains are the most fun to do, I think. But I kind of had to accept that I don't have necessarily that deep, you know, dark, brooding you know villainous voice you know that's actually difficult for me to get down there um so i you know i do play a little bit more of the uh, of the younger character so i don't get to play exactly what i want to do sometimes um like i remember there was a show um and i'm blanking on the name but i wanted i wanted to lead so bad in that show and i remember even I, i read for mike and I remember driving away thinking, man, I just didn't get it. I just I, I, I could turn around right now and I trust I think Mike would let me read again. But I didn't. But then I heard the actor who they got and he was definitely about two or three octaves lower than me. And he fit the character perfectly. And so that was kind of my first realization, like, OK, I need to see where my voice archetype fits. You know, and that's something I'm, I'm hoping to study more of, you know, to see where I fit and, and how to and it, because that leads. How do I present myself to other studios now, like here in L.A., to say this is my voice, you know, and these are the type of characters I can do with it. You know, so it's it's, it's definitely a learning process. Um, and I think, again, you know, a lot of people just think uh, I'll just call up a studio and and they'll put me in something in a lead role. <laughs> Well, and I think even with Harley, it's, you know, it's been how many years? I mean, we're getting, you know, close to 10 years, you know, back. Well, I guess it is a little bit before if you say that 2004 when you started uh, dubbing the character. Uh, well, that was my that was my first year. I started in 04 with Funimation. And then, so it's uh, been almost 10 years. Almost 10 years. Yeah. And it looks like what they're looking for today is more like just actor experience, you know, just to have some experience. Uh, you know, like you've been talking about doing uh, theater and, and stage acting, uh, as well as some other things. Uh, they're looking for a variety, it seems like. You have to work. You, ha- you have to you- you know, you have to work, you have to teach, you know, find classes and, you know, do theater, do, you know, record yourself. I mean, that was another thing, hearing my voice for the first time as another character. Uh, even my own mother didn't recognize me, <laughs> you know. So, um, yeah, I was it, I, we had a good laugh about it. Um, but, you know, this is this is you know the entertainment business, and, and this is just in general is is extremely competitive. Uh, you know, like out here, I'm you know I'm I'm going to be joining SAG after, which is the actors union, which you know you have to be a member of if you want to do major TV film projects. And the last statistic I read, I think it was about 97% of union members make less than $5,000 a year acting. So that just goes to show, you know, how competitive this is. Um, and uh, a motto that one of my teachers in my undergrad always said, and it, 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 
I, I use it as inspiration, and I, I, I don't want to. I, I don't use it to discourage, but to inspire myself. I always, I always kind of tell myself, my competition is working harder than I am, so I've got to step up. You know, you've got to. What gets you seen is finding out what's unique about you. What can you bring to the table? What the you know the problem for the casting directors is we our problem is casting this part, and you want to be the solution. So, you know, when I go into an audition, I say, I'm the solution for their problem. Now, I don't necessarily get everything I read for, obviously, but, you know, that's everybody. But you have to have, find out what's unique in you and what you can bring to the table. And that that's continuous training, you know, and, and classes and, and practicing. You know, I, I, I was just talking last night about maybe getting a, 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 a play reading group together just to read plays with each other, just to hear other characters, you know. Again, I think it's so awesome that you, even doing it all these years, you still go to classes and polish up on what you're doing. It's it's really a testament to people that get into acting that they need to keep working at it, and especially these kids that want to get into anime. Oh, you have to. You have to. Um, you know, even the big names still. I mean, I know Al Pacino and, and uh, um, Robert De Niro are members of the Actors Studio, and if I recall correctly, they still go out and will, you know, teach classes or do classes, you know, and... and you know, you have to, you know, if you want to be great at something, you have to, you have to practice. Um, it's consistency. Consistency, yeah. And uh, there's a, another actor, Glenn Morshower, who I really love. He's a, a motivational speaker and actor. And he put it very well one time. Uh, acting is not a sprint. It's a marathon. So if you want to be in this, if you, if you really want to do this, it's a lifelong commitment. It really mm -hmm. is, you know, to to creating characters. And, and, and that leads, you know, another thing, too, I know some kids I've, I've talked to said, well, I want to do voice acting so I can be famous and do conventions. And it's like I've been doing this for 10 years. I've been invited to, I think, three conventions in my life. You know, you have to love what you're doing and do it well. And the fame, whatever that is to you, will follow. But if you're going to just start and just say, I want to be famous – you're going to be sitting there for a long time not doing anything. And I think that's the thing with every – I'm sorry to cut you off, um, mm -hmm. but it, it's, it's the thing with everything really. It's like yeah. some people are like, well, I want to do this to be famous. I want to do this to get money. It's like, well, why not do it because you love to do it? Exactly. Because if you love to do it, then you won't – then the money and everything, that's second nature. That will come later on. But if Absolutely. you love to do it. If That's you exactly love right. to go in the studio or if you love to go in the door and clock in, clock out, and you love to be there, then it won't – it shouldn't matter about the money or, or how many people love you or anything like that. It should matter that you come in and you love to do your job or you love to do this passion that you've wanted for so long. Exactly. And, I mean like right now, I mean what I did, I mean I'm literally sitting in a, in a sound booth that I built myself because I wanted to do this and so I do it at home. So, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, you're absolutely right. That's a great way to put it. So do you do a lot of recording from home? I do. Yeah. No, I, uh, I, uh, I started working for a children's book company about three years ago and I had a little home set up. I, you know, I have, I have a small studio apartment here in LA and it was just a, a wooden frame with blankets. And I have this thing called the Harlan Hogan Porta booth, which works great. Don't get me wrong, but I had to turn my AC off. I would have to unplug my refrigerator because of that compressor sound. And it just got ridiculously hot and it was just horrible. So um, for uh, I, I found a, a guy online who, who sold plans to build your own sound booth. Because a pre-built one I think start at around $3,500 and I just didn't have the money for that. But um, this guy sold these plans and you got all the supplies at Home Depot. So for about 1500 and about a month's work of working on weekends, I built my own sound booth. And so now I can do my children's books at home and, and uh, I do some audio books uh, on Amazon now. And, uh, and then all, all my auditions for my agent. I, you know, she doesn't have a, there's no booth at the agency. So she'll send me the script. I record it here. Sounds great. And I send it off. Since you have your own home studio, have you ever just recorded an audition for Funimation and sent it in before? Uh, well, I don't do anything for Funimation because the anime and most video games, you won't, they record in the studio. And the reason I do that is, is because you have multiple actors on the same project. You know, each booth kind of has its own ambient room noise. And so you want to keep everything consistent. So 
Um, I haven't actually read for Funimation in years. I'd love to, but you know, again, it's taking the time to travel out there and, and that kind of thing. Um, but like for Bang Zoom, uh, they'll I'll I'll do my audition at home, and then I'll just drive. If I get cast, I'll just drive to the studio and and do that. But uh, like all my audiobooks, um, I, I record here at home now. Yeah. I want to ask about the uh, children's uh, book company that you mentioned earlier. Um, well, yeah, I mean, uh, the children's book, it, it's, uh, it's actually, it's, it's a company called Book Buddy. And um, what it is is that publishers go to them. Um, and so I record books that it's it, with a, there's a computer device that they have. It's connected so that the kids are listening to me read the book, but they're also watching on a screen. It's, it's help, you know, with comprehension and that kind of thing, which is really only in schools. Um, I do have a couple of books I read for some authors, uh, on, uh, for Amazon. One is, a uh, I think it's a great crime novel called, uh, the pits by a guy named Greg Smith, um, which is a, a great crime adventure, uh, about a, a Marine captain who adopts a dog in Afghanistan and they get injured and they come back for recovery and they get hooked up with these college kids who are trying to take down illegal dog fighting rings. And there's a big adventure to Miami and there's a drug lord and it's a lot of fun. So there's that one. And then there's another one. And I honestly can't remember the name of it right now. And uh, I'll, I'll get back to you on that one. <laughs> I'd love a copy. Sure. Well, if you want, I mean, uh, I was, I was going to say because uh, I, I did this for the other show I, I was on. Um, if anybody's interested and if they can contact you, if you don't mind. Um, I've got, uh, about, I think five or 10 free codes to get a free copy off audible.com. So if anybody's interested and maybe is willing to listen, cause it's about a 10 hour listening time, it's a full length novel. Um, but if anybody's interested, um, and is willing to maybe do a review, an honest review, you can tell me if I suck or not, you know, but just something to put up on Amazon or audible, I'll, g I'll, I'll give anybody a free copy. Oh, I'll definitely take them. All right. Cool. 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 I have a couple of questions that aren't necessarily related. Um, do you ever listen to your own work? And uh, somebody from my work actually wanted to ask you, what was your favorite uh, fight in Sword Art Online? Yeah, I, I, I sometimes have a hard time listening to myself thinking, I could have done that so much better. Um, uh I think the last fight, you know, where I where, where I reveal that I can't be, I think I, I think I reveal because this was two years ago. Uh, I think I revealed I can't get harmed or something, or I, you know, I'm 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 immortal or whatever, and just be able to express that and just you know slice and dice. You know, I think the whole that whole last battle was a lot of fun. For me, I hate to say it, I haven't seen much of Sword Art Online yet, um, but the guy I work with, like I said, he uh, wanted me to ask you about that. Uh, he's a huge fan of the show and uh, the character that uh, you play in the show. <laughs> yeah yeah heathcliff yeah he was a he was a fun fun guy i think that was like the first uh major anime character i did for bang zoom yeah i didn't know that i thought funimation actually had the rights to that nope nope that was that was, that was bang zoom yep Looking back here just a little bit could you remember maybe the last project you actually worked on for funimation <laughs> The last time I worked for Funimation um, in studio, I think it was – must have been about 2009, I think, right before I moved out here. I drove up to visit some family in Dallas and – or it might have been before that. I think the last thing I worked on there was uh, – what's the host club show? Um, oh, yeah, or, or, on, or on High School Host Club. Uh, Caitlin brought me in for a, a little quick character, which was a lot of fun because actually it, it's two guys in the scene, and Chris Kazan uh, was the other guy, and, and I uh, he's a, he's a good buddy of mine. I really and that was fun. And then actually out here, Mike did something very generous for me, and um, I'm, I'm extremely thankful uh, for this. But uh, Full Metal Alchemist season two started recording after I moved out to L.A. and Fury. Uh, appears in it. You, know, you see him a lot, but he doesn't talk a lot. I mean, I think it was like batches of like 11 lines to recast me, you know, um, because it wouldn't be worth me you know, spending money to fly all the way out there to do an hour's worth of work and fly back, you know. But uh, what Mike did was he recorded Fury's lines in the inflection and tempo uh, to match the flaps that he wanted. He emailed them to me, and then Bang Zoom was extremely generous uh, more than once, letting me use a studio and an engineer for free to record Fury's lines and then email them off back to Funimation. So 
Um, that was a couple of years ago. Yeah, so that's probably the la- last time that uh, uh, I worked for Funimation. Yeah. Probably found it difficult to uh, recast the character. Honestly, is what it sounds like. Maybe I don't know. I I just I remember Mike sending me an email saying, "Hey, Kevin, do you think you could record in L.A.?" And I'm like, "Well, I could try." And uh, he said, well, we want you to do Fury. And it was just, I was, I was very, very thankful for that. Oh, and I actually, I did, uh, there was a character I did on um, One Piece, a guy by the name of Pell, who made a, uh, did a, did a movie and that, an episode. It was, I did a movie with him in it. And then there was an episode of the series that was pretty much the movie again. Uh, just pulling scenes from it, uh, but we had to re-record because the animation actually was different. But he popped up again, like maybe three or four lines, and he did the same thing. That might have been the last thing I did uh, was Pell. Yeah, so um, I'm hoping to, you know, my goal is actually, you know, I'm trying to get back more into anime. I took some time off from it, doing theater and and working on some short films out here. But uh, I'm going to reach out and see if uh, if uh, some studios are, are open to hearing me. So we'll see. I think my question is, is does it make it easier for you to kind of get back into it, you know, considering you've taken some acting classes, you have a resume, and that you've been in the business for a while getting back in? It does. It it does. Uh, I, you know, it, it uh, you know, because, again, you know, you have so many people that want to do this and who don't quite understand the process. Uh, and I'm not saying that to try to be demeaning at all. It's just that, you know, people just dive in because they love it. And that's fantastic that they love it. Um, but, you know, a resume shows that, you know, I've I've acted before. I know how to do the beep system. I've, I've written a couple scripts. They're not great, but I've done it. Um, I've directed, you know, it, I, I know what I'm I have a pretty good idea of what I'm doing and I have experience. And, and obviously having a resume that shows, you know, obviously you're castable. You know that people kept casting me and stuff, so that that does give us, and, that, and that's for any resume for an actor saying, well, obviously, you bring something to the table that that works, and let's see how we can get you to fit in. So it definitely definitely helps, you know. Um, and then word of mouth, though, too. I mean, that's you know, it, it really is, especially out here. Also, uh, who you know, um, Kyle Abair was very generous when I first moved out here. And kind of pimped me out to a number of studios, just saying, I got a Texas friend here. You know, he's a voice actor. He knows ADR. You know, use him if you can. And that that got me a couple of gigs. So it uh, it definitely helps. You know, anything that shows that you that you know what you're doing, and that uh, you have been cast, and that you people like to work with you. And I hope people like to work with me. <laughs> So are you still able to hang out with a lot of voice actors or, or go to dinner with a lot of people and kind of talk about the working in anime? Uh, for example, just like a show maybe you worked on with somebody, just uh, getting together and maybe just uh, talking about that with them or uh, maybe uh, with some of the people that uh, have done audiobooks if you maintain a relationship with them? Um, uh, I, you know, I, I, the funny thing is I don't know a lot of other anime voice actors. Um besides the ones who've directed me. And, they, and again, that's just from, you know, you know, a lot of the big names, you know, who do the conventions all the time are always around each other. But I have some non-anime actors who, who that's all they do is, is audio books. Um, in fact, the, the how I got my two, and this is a, a, a great resource for people who maybe even want to try this, you know, with the, um, with the, um, the birth of uh, e-publishing, you know, uh, almost anybody can put out a book. Now, whether that's good or bad, you know, that depends on writing level. But, um, the, there's a website called ACX, uh, Audio Creation Exchange, which is owned by Amazon, where uh, you directly audition for authors looking for audiobook narrators. And so uh, that's how I got my two books, is I just made an account, you use your Amazon account, I signed up, I auditioned and, and got my projects. And, you know, uh, there's, a, a, a co- again, a couple non-anime actors I, I know out here who, uh, that's all they do is audiobooks, you know, and, uh, that, you know, where, where you get to play a ton of different characters, which is a lot of fun. Yeah, even characters you don't normally play. All at once, yeah, you know. I think it's funny for me, I think the only audiobook I listened to growing up was a, a little bit of the Harry Potter series. I think probably the first and third book I heard a little bit um, in audio form. Uh, but that's probably the only ones I've ever heard. Well, that guy, I have to say, is amazing. I, and his name escapes me. He, he, he's also the voice on the on the, he, he does all the narration on the on the on the on the DVD and Blu-ray releases on the menus. But he actually won a Grammy for his audiobook work on Harry Potter, and uh, won, I believe, don't I double check, but I believe he won a uh, he holds a Guinness World Record 
for creating like over 150 unique characters in one audiobook. Wow. He's amazing and an amazing theater actor. So there goes to show that uh, once again, theater comes into play. Mm hmm. But that's a, yeah, that that to, to get a great lesson in audiobooks, uh, listen to him. I remember the first one I did for the children's book company, um, which you know again, out of nowhere, I had been invited by my undergrad in San Antonio to be a guest artist, and to do the Tempest uh, production with the kids, and so of course they all looked me up and, and were looking at the voiceover stuff and. Maybe about a month into rehearsals, one of the tech girls just happened to mention, for whatever reason, said, my best friend works for a children's book company. I wonder if they're looking for anybody. And I, was, and I will look for voiceover work anywhere. And I said, what's the email? How can I audition? And the first book I got was uh, uh, it's a series of four little horror books, you know, about 30 pages, big print. But the four main characters in the first book were girls. And I'm thinking, how do I voice angsty teenage girls, <laughs> you know, and not sound like I'm a girl, you know. So I quickly had to do some research and uh, uh, I found a website where a, a, a seasoned audiobook narrator was talking about how he approached, you know, doing female voices. And it's all about attitude. And then I decided uh, to listen. Uh, I'm a huge fan of Zachary Quinto, who is most probably famous now for Spock in the new Star Trek movies. He did the audiobook of the novelization of the first Star Trek movie. Hmm. So I found a scene where he plays Uhura. And it's obviously Zachary Quinto talking. He does, you know, change the tempo and speed. You know, that's you know, the tools. You change your voice a little bit. But I noticed it was all about the attitude of Uhura. And I thought that's the key is find the attitude of the character. And then I did the four female girl, uh, female leads, and it was great. And now how I got into that segue, I'm not sure how. What was the, what was the, what was the first question? <laughs> Man, I don't even remember what I had asked you there. <laughs> yeah. That. Okay, cool. Sorry. I, I go tangential thinking a lot. Sorry. No, it, it's fine. <laughs> it, it tends to happen sometimes, I guess, with the best of us either. Sure. You know, we, we go off and we have a topic and, and then there's just one little you know, it's one little story or one little subject that we just can't get over or can't, you know, stop talking about. And we just get go in and talk and talk. And then the, the next thing you know, it's 45 minutes went by. It's like, oh, have I talked this long? <laughs> <laughs> exactly, you know? right? And honestly, over the course of doing, you know, 20 some odd episodes of the podcast, the, the same thing happens to me. I get caught up in a tangent and it's just, you know, you, you go on and on and on for you know 20 minutes and sometimes uh, you forget what you're talking about yourself. So it's just one of those things. <laughs> um, but one question I was meaning to ask was, uh, do you find that people that you work with as far as voice acting, do they try to use that to bridge into directing? And do you know a lot of people that uh, direct now that maybe didn't do voice acting uh, before? Um, the ones I've worked with. Oh, and I take that back. No, I take that back. Um, there was, there are two guys at Funimation. Yes, they act, but a majority of the time they're just directing. Uh, it was Zach Bolton, I think. Uh, and I mean, that may have changed now again. We're talking, you know, again, I, 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 uh, I moved uh, to L.A. in 2009, so I haven't been there in a few years. At the time, I, remember, I think, remember, Zach was more of a director, great, great director. In fact, he, he directed me on, my, on, my, uh, on the lead role I did in a show called Rumbling Hearts. And then um, I am blanking out on the other gentleman, but he was a great director. And I think uh, uh, so, not necessarily, but the majority of the ones I've worked with, like Mike's an, obviously an actor, Colleen Klinkenbeard, Kate Glass, Chris Kazin. Uh, I've been directed by Tony Oliver out here, who obviously is, you know, a ridiculously amazing resume as a voice actor, but he's also a director and writer and producer. Um, uh, and I think I think now, just reading some of the some some of the department heads now at Funimation, are, are a lot of them are actors now who've moved into doing other things, you know. Um, because, you know, when you're voice acting, I mean, voice acting, if, if you're just an anime voice actor like me, who wasn't all, you know, not necessarily doing all the big shows all the time, it's not a full time job. I mean, I could I think I think on I think on average, I maybe worked about eight to 10 hours a month at Funimation just as an actor, you know, which is why, you know, uh, I think a lot of uh, actors go into directing and then line producing and then writing, you know, so you just keep working in the business because, you know, sometimes it, it can get pretty lean, you know. In I there. think that's and I think that's another thing that people may uh, 
get confused on or, or think yes. they know more about is, is, oh, you're there all day. It's a full time job. No, you're, you're doing it all the time. It's like, no, nope, no, <laughs> no. The, the, the good rule of thumb that I always uh, another another teacher I had in undergrad would say, once you're cast in something, you're out of a job because it's usually a finite job. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, it was great getting rumbling hearts. It was 14 episodes. I was out of a job already, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, and, and definitely, I mean, because I mean, there's like I said, there's 300 on-call actors at least when I was there at Funimation. So, you know, it's all 300 are not working every single day. There's only there's only four booths at the studio, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. There's only so much time, you know, you can get in and when you're needed, you know. And and again, there's no guarantee that you're going to get cast in everything you read for. You know, there's plenty of shows I've read for that. I mean, maybe I ended up being like I read for a lead role out here on a on a on a on a on a film on a foreign film dub, and I was really interested in it because I, I liked the character, but I knew I didn't get it because they brought me in for a Walla session on it. <laughs> so you're not going to get everything you read for, you know. So yeah, it's it's definitely not a full time. I mean, you know, the 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 ideal goal of any actor, especially out here in L.A., you know, is to get a series regular on a show that's successful, you know. But beyond that, you know. 98% of this job is rejection. So it's a, it's a, it's a, you have to have a really tough skin to, to get out here and you're, and you, you know, and you, you, you have to have a day job, you and know, and, to and get I, that success. And, and for me personally, um, with me being, not trying to get into writing myself. Yeah. Um, it, it, it I mean, I have friends that, uh, well, I have one friend that that's right now trying to get into do getting published Mm-hmm. And, you know, oh, that's no. it's the same thing, really, if when I think about it, it's the same thing with as from uh, voice acting as is writing is it's 90 percent of its rejection because absolutely there's so many people out there that want to do it. And there's yep. so many people that want their book to be noticed. But it, it, it's just like overcoming that initial 90 percent of rejection until that one or two says, OK, yeah. we want you. Exactly. I mean, it's persistence. You yeah. have to you have to believe in yourself and what you have to offer. And that may be fine tuning what you have, you know, you know, it. Uh, you know, getting advice from other people or your critiques and that kind of thing. I mean, look at J.K. Rowling. I mean, how many times was Harry Potter rejected before Scholastic picked up Scholastic of all people? And now it's a huge project. You know, I just saw an, an article, an interview with uh, Mark Ruffalo, who is amazing as Bruce Banner and the Hulk. And he even says in his article, I was rejected 600 times in auditions. You know, that was my record. I kept track. I was I lost parts 600 times before, you know, you get your big break. So it's uh, like you just got to be uh, bullheaded about it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I mean, if you if you if you have the skill and you put the work in and and you're constantly trying to make it different, make it better for you. Um, the persistence will pay off. I mean, again, I mean, I read I when I when I got interested in voiceover work was when I was at UCLA and one of the director slash teachers there's flat out said it's ridiculously hard to get into. You probably won't make it. I read I, I picked up every voiceover book I could for two years to just read and read about it and different approaches. And I would ask other actors, do you do voiceover? What was it like? What kind do you do? You know? And really started listening. I, I started listening to audiobooks. I started listening to, you know, really listening to documentaries on Discovery Channels. Like, why did he say or she say the line this way and not this way? You know, and how do you approach something where you're not seen? And, and really just started to try and figure out because there, were, there weren't any classes at the time, you know, uh, uh, because people just said it's too hard to get into. I mean, there's a reason why you would hear the same guy who goes Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. You'd hear him in Miami and New York and Chicago and, and Seattle and L.A. because it was such a small little circle, you know. But once you're in, you're in. But getting there, you know, you have to be persistent and, and to really educate yourself. Now, thankfully, now with the Internet and and there's tons of books and they actually have classes now, you know, but you, you have to take them. You know, you can't just say, well, I was told I have a great voice and I can do you know, I can do these five wacky voices. I should be doing voiceover work. It's like, well, you got some other little steps to take, you know, so. It's also a lesson of how valuable these classes really are in helping you develop as not just a voice actor, but an actor in general. Absolutely. Yeah, because one, it shows that you're doing that you're that you're taking training, 
you know, um, you know, showing that you're, I mean, on my resume, it, it shows, I show every school I've been to. I mean, my undergrad, my grad school, I studied in London for two months. I studied in Ireland for two months. You know, I put that all on there. I put all the, the major teachers uh, that I've had here in LA, especially, you know, because, you know, they're known. Um, and so if it shows that you are putting that work in, you know, that, uh, that it shows that you're not coming in cold, that you, you know, that you, you're really trying to discover how is this done you know, you're not saying I know how it's done when you really don't um, because you just because you've, you've got in your head this, you know, lovely dreamlike version of how it's done. And then figuring out, oh, this is what a cattle call is. There's 500 people here for one part, you know, so um, definitely uh, show that you have education that you're in that you're and that you're getting out there and learning. So when you guys go into record and you, you know, obviously you're giving your voice to a character. Uh, how much altering uh, kind of goes on after that, and uh, is there a lot of manipulation as far as the pitch of your voice, the tone, as far as uh, how loud or low your voice is, or how, how much of that is really played with, and how much do effects uh, come into play when you're in the recording booth? It's, it's, it, it's, it's me. It's my voice. You know, unless the character's called for where they actually, you know, where it's noticeable manipulation. Um, that's the uniqueness that I bring. It's my specific voice. It's my specific uh, approach to to um, to acting a character. Um, I mean, now I, I have heard, you know, like uh, uh, there was a director I was talking to that they have a, a newer actress who, when she gets nervous, her voice changes pitch a little bit. And it doesn't sound like the character she's been doing. But with the power of Pro Tools, they can fine tune it a little bit. And that, that's just minor fine tuning. Majority of the time, what you're hearing from me is what you're getting on 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 a project. Yeah. Like on a show for Dragon Ball Z, where you have the screams and and a lot of explosions and and higher pitches and stuff. Um, there's some effects going on there. Can you elaborate just a little bit on that? Oh well, that I mean, yeah, that's that's all in mixing and mastering, you know, because you know sometimes it's just, it's a technical thing. If there's a loud explosion, but you need to hear the scream, you know, the scream's going to be a little louder, that kind of thing. Now there. I just remembered one thing, though, that uh, there was some in manipulation. Um, when I was directing Peach Girl, uh, a great actor named Rob McCullum uh, was one of the leads on that show. And there was one line of dialogue, and I forget what was wrong. There was something wrong with it. But, you know, to call a man to drive all the way to the studio for one single line was a little ridiculous, you know. Um, it, 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 and, and we didn't want to waste his time. So I'm, I'm trying to figure out because I was directing I was actually directing at uh, at, at um, uh, uh, Ocatron 5000, which is a different studio that was being rented out by Funimation. <clears throat> and yeah, yeah, yeah. Chris. Yeah. Chris Abbott studio. The, the Funimation rented a booth there. And, and that's where they that's where they put me for my first directing job. So uh, we didn't want Rob to have to drive all the way out there and do one little line and leave, you know, Um we were going to have to do that in the end, you know, there was no other option because he had already finished all his recording and I hadn't, I didn't have anything new for him. But then the engineer said, hold on. Cause we had the lead actress there. And he said, he asked her to say the line. So he said it. Um, oh, cause it literally, it was, it was like two words in the line were wrong. It wasn't the whole line, just these two little words. And he did his manipulation and he made her sound like him and slice in those two words. Like within 10 minutes. It was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. I could. So there's, that's the most extreme manipulation I've ever seen, I think. It was, it was, an, it was an amazing thing to watch. I honestly think that's really cool because, you know, it really helps the actor to not have to come in and just record one line like you were talking about earlier. Um, how that could inconvenience that person. And, uh, you know, honestly, it could be, could be off-putting for them in the future. Um, but one thing I was kind of curious about is say you were cast in a long-term role, um, how would you feel about that? And obviously, um, if another company, uh, you were referring to Bang Zoom earlier, uh, say they did pick up Case Closed by some miracle of miracles, obviously, um, would Harley be a character that you would, uh, be open to playing for a different company with a new cast and uh that's something i'm curious about as well as like i said the uh, long-term role of a character if you were cast as a long-term lead character 
Well, definitely. I mean, that just means rent's going to be paid on a more consistent basis. <laughs> um, no, uh, yeah, I mean, there's always, for me, I mean, I won't speak for anybody else. This is just me. I mean, I always get excited when, you know, I, well, I think any actor gets excited when they get cast in something, um, and especially when that's long term. And where I might spend a little bit more time, you know, to, seeing, to, to do a little bit more research, you know, if I can find more episodes, you know, to watch, you know, what 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 his journey is. You know, I like to try and find um, what what the character's journey is. Why is he important to the episode? You know, and, you know, how does this affect any future things? Um, and because that's that's where the creativity comes from. That's where that's where you get to play. You know, and, and hopefully, you know, in, in conjunction with the director, you know, and and uh, uh, it's nice to sit in a character for a while. You know, I, I definitely um, enjoy longer runs of, you know, whatever it is like in theater. I, I, I did some rep theater out here and we do a show for six months, you know, and that's where you kind of get to play every time. And, and, and I mean, again, this is the same script over and over. But here, you know, in anime, I mean, if I could play Harley, you know, you know, once a month, that would be a lot of fun to do and to to enjoy what 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 he gets to do you know and how he can mess around with conan and, and solve crimes so yeah it would be correct to assume that you would play that character long term then oh absolutely uh, i i would definitely i mean again any actor called back to play a part would be fantastic um i mean i you know when i that was a very exciting time because that was a very again the very first show i worked on um, and so, you know, that was a very exciting time for me personally as an actor, you know, getting into this business. Um, and uh, I did keep up with the show a little bit. You know, I really enjoyed it. Um, and, of course, you know, always disappointed, you know, when I heard how long it was, I mean, how many episodes there were. And it just kept coming and coming and coming. I thought, well, wow, this is going to go on for a while, you know. And then um, it didn't. You know, again, I mean, it got a little sporadic. I think I, you know, came in a couple more times. And, uh, you know, it's always kind of sad when, when something, you know, and, and again, it, it, you know, was it ratings on Cartoon Network? You know, was the, did the, did the contract end, you know, with Funimation or Cartoon Network or the Japanese producers? There's so many variables of, you know, that, that could be, that we, you know, may not know. Um, uh, so definitely, you know, sad that it, 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 it did because obviously, I mean, even today, I mean, obviously with your, with your podcast, it shows it's a very loved show. Um, and that maybe sadly overall, you know, uh, it, the, the market quite wasn't there for it or, or it was, or again, it just wasn't, you know, because of the time slots and, you know, people couldn't access it the way they wanted to. And then the interest waned, you know, there's, there's so many things in there, but if another company did pick it up and they said, Hey, Kevin, would you like to play Hartley? I'd be knocking on the door saying I'm here for my recording session. <laughs> been a huge talk around the community with uh, me and D wall here. Um, really we've been discussing lately the loop on the third uh, versus Conan uh, crossovers that are coming over uh, or coming out here in the U.S. Uh, rather um, being released by a company called Discotech. Um, and what Discotech's been doing lately is releasing uh, licensed uh, stuff that they've licensed from Japan uh, over here, and a lot of it's subbed. Uh, they've only recently started getting into dubbing with uh, the uh, Jurgen's Gravestone movie, which is a loop on the third movie. Um, but the crossover is obviously a subbed only release, uh, coming over here to the U S on the 27th. And, uh, I think the, the big debate for us is, is that if it sells really well, um, we're hoping that discotech licenses maybe some sort of an English dub for the show. Um, but how would you feel if something happened where they wanted to do a whole new cast and everybody was completely just scrapped and they started with a whole new cast all together uh for the show um if that were to happen at some point well if you know i mean that is that is something that can happen if a different studio picks it up you know and then decides to completely recast it I, i'm not sure where this lo you know this company is located um <clears throat> like it's kind of like what happened with one piece uh four kids had it for a couple of years with a completely different cast in New York. And so then Funimation picked it up and obviously it was recast. No one from the original cast that I know of was invited to come back to that. So, um, and you know, I've been replaced on projects and I've replaced people on projects. Um, it's, it's just that sadly, I mean, it just kind of is the nature of the business. I'd be very sad, 
you know, if if it let you know, let's say a company even here in L.A. you know picked it up and and said, but we want to do a completely new, new cast, and that may not be them. That may be the Japanese producers. That may be you know, again, we it's there's so many variables you know in, in all of this, but um, uh, to you know, I, I'd probably be a, a, a little, a little miffed, you know, hearing Harley voiced by somebody else in the, in an English dub. Um, We'd feel the same way. Yeah. Oh, well, good. That's good. That's very kind. That's very kind. Yeah. No, he's again. He, he and 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 you know, I, I'm very thankful for all the stuff I did at Funimation. But but Harley and Kane Fury are are two of my you know biggest loves in the characters that I played. Um, they're very special to me, and uh, I, I will jump at jump at any chance to play them again.